Considered one of the greatest games of all time, Metroid Prime has a legacy in pushing a one-stormer Nintendo series into one of Nintendo's most beloved franchises with a dedicated fan base. But the creation of this game wasn't easy to achieve, with its deep history in its creation of an entire company being an entirely different game and major shakeups during development. This, as such, also produced a great deal of content that never saw the day of light, including numerous boss battles, abilities, and designs for Samus to name a few. So today on a special episode of Cut Content, we'll be looking at both the history and the beta unused content of Metroid Prime. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell too to further support us and keep creating new videos. 1998, an era where gaming was at a major high point, a year with tons of major releases including The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, Banjo-Kazooie, Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil 2, and Final Fantasy VIII. But during that same year, a major change was brewing behind the scenes at Nintendo. With plans already underway to make a next-gen 128-bit console, Nintendo wanted to step into the next generation with a more adult appearance as a result of them facing much stiffer competition as of late in the form of the PlayStation 1 as it appealed to an older market. And so, in an alliance between Nintendo and Jeff Spangenberg, the founder of Iguana Entertainment who developed the Turok series for the Nintendo 64, they made Retro Studios under the mission statement of making more adult-oriented content to complement Nintendo's catalog of IPs that mainly aimed towards children and teenagers at the time. And so, within the next two years, hiring sprang about going from 4 people in 98, 25 in 99, and by 2000, they had 125 people. So, the company divided up into four teams to make four projects to pitch to Nintendo. These included NFL Retro Football, an RPG named Ravenblade, a racer called Thunder Rally, and an untitled action-adventure game. Being still rather new, the work environment was chaotic and development was falling behind schedule. As such, Nintendo took notice and sent three major representatives to evaluate the progress at the company. These included the late Satoru Iwata, prior to being president, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Senior Director of Production at Nintendo of America, Tom Prada. Shigeru Miyamoto, of course, ended up personally evaluating each and every project with strong critique and writing them off without hesitation, except for the proposal for the mysterious untitled action-adventure game. The action-adventure game was pitched as a sci-fi shooter featuring three attractive women who would fight these bug-like aliens and a neo-Nazi villain as well. Miyamoto was impressed by this pitch, and saw a lot of potential in them in creating a female-led sci-fi shooter that fought bug-like aliens, much like an already existing Nintendo IP. At that point, Miyamoto suggested that the company should, alongside this game, create a new entry to the Metroid series, a long dormant Nintendo IP at that point. And so shortly after, they obtained the approval to use the Metroid IP, with that, Retro Studios, while recommended to work on both the untitled action-adventure game and Metroid at the same time, decided to take all their resources and the very team of the sci-fi shooter and turn it into a full-time Metroid team. This move had a massive ripple effect throughout the company and eventually led to the cancellation of those other three games that they were making in order to put all their eggs into the one major Nintendo IP that they had landed. And thus began the development of a 3D Metroid, as a third-person shooter. It didn't take long for Retro Studios to quickly put together an FMV's teaser for Space World 2000, where we finally saw Samus in her own 3D game at long last. Though despite it being FMV, it was still using real assets from development at that time, including a different looking Samus. This version of the Varia suit resembled her suit from Super Metroid, which left audiences impressed. In fact, Samus had a number of different designs during development. One design featured her with a more angular and aggressive look, featuring a thinner visor and a more athletic waist, almost like the suit was formed around her entirely, which wasn't far off as these sketches did showcase how tightly against her body it was. But at last, we move into 2001, where we finally get a proper trailer to the now-titled Metroid Prime. 
Samus' design had changed here. The proportions were the bigger change here, of course, being a bit shorter and her shoulder pads now being a good deal larger, resembling the final one she had actually. As well, Samus' cannon looked different too. While it's hard to tell how it exactly looked here, we do have a render of this version of Samus, which showed her with a silver and rather simplistic arm cannon before we slowly got to the complicated one that we got today. In fact, while we never saw this version demoed, we have concept art of an older cannon that came after that and before the final one. This one even featured a charge meter, potentially to show the maximum extent of the charge beam. Now going back to that render, other than the cannon, the armor has an odd look to it. It's rather rusted and scratched up. Not surprising since it would have been after Metroid 1 where Samus barely escaped an explosion. But it definitely stands in contrast to Samus' final armor which is quite shiny. In fact, this design evolved once more to add some blue containers to it. Eventually, the higher ups decide that this design of Samus was no good and ordered artist Gene Kohler to design a more clean and polished design for Samus. And so they started again from scratch and as a result we got the Samus that we know today. And in my personal opinion back then and even now, when I first saw the design, it was jaw dropping how beautiful it looked. While these were the ever changing designs of Samus, there was one more that existed that was found within the data of the game, and it's the beta version of the Phazon suit. As many of you remember, the Phazon suit has a black and red aesthetic to it. Here it is literally the color of Phazon, cyan and navy, and there is actually a small hint of it in the old art too for this Metroid Prime boss battle that featured this version of the suit. And an oddity is that there are two different morph balls designed for it that are found within the data. Potentially they were deciding which one to use for the suit before scrapping it all together and using the one that we got today. It has been confirmed that it was removed for not feeling evil enough, and considering the plans for a sequel were to feature a Dark Samus made from the Phazon suit, I can't imagine her running around in this color scheme. And one other cut design choice were these animations for Samus' face. Yes, the one that we see reflected off her visor sometimes. A total of 7 exists that have her looking in different directions, 2 expressions, none of which were used of course. Now as we mentioned earlier, before Metroid Prime was put into the perspective that we all love, it was in third person. Now Metroid Prime didn't begin development going fully into the idea that it had to be in third person. In fact, it was an ongoing debate with the producer wanting first person. However, the team was dead set on wanting a third person game, and so the majority won. For the time being. And so development went on throughout 2000 while in third person. No real footage of it exists except this one screenshot of Samus in third person in the Chozo ruins. However, Shigeru Miyamoto returned again, ready to shake up the company to its core once more. This time, it was to change the game's perspective into first person, as he believed that third person wouldn't be very intuitive enough for the game. This led to the team having to go back and redo and rewrite large amounts of the game from scratch, essentially a near restart to production. And so in 2001 at Space World, they were able to finally get development back on track and presented their first look at Metroid Prime now in first person, featuring Samus' beta cannon at that. Now while developing this game, the game had a lot of influence from Super Metroid, from Samus' earlier designs as mentioned, to enemies which we'll shortly get to, and even utilizing her 2D abilities in 3D. Two of these abilities were however cut, but their scan image remains in the data. One of these is the famous speed booster ability, where when she runs for long enough, she'd gain extra speed and can smash through walls even. Metroid Prime of course didn't have any long hallways, so it was difficult to implement, therefore scrapped. The next one is the Spring Ball, where Samus as a Morph Ball could jump. This of course ended up returning in Metroid Prime 3, and the trilogy pack of Metroid Prime also had it. Meaning this was probably cut rather late into development as they probably didn't have enough time to finish it. 
Now being the series' first entry into 3D, this was during an era where voice work was becoming more and more common, and so, with Metroid entering this era, they hired voice actress Jennifer Hale, most famous for her role as Naomi Hunter in Metal Gear Solid, as the first lady of gaming herself now. While she did all her grunts that we hear in the game, she didn't have any voice lines. However, this wasn't always the case. Deep within the data of the game, a voice monologue of hers exists that was set to play out at the start of the game to recap the story of Metroid 1. Have a listen. Ten years ago, below the surface of planet Zebes, the mercenaries known as space pirates were defeated by interstellar bounty hunter Samus Aran. Descending to the very core of the pirate stronghold, Samus exterminated the energy-based parasites called Metroids and defeated Mother Brain, the leader of the pirate horde. But the space pirates were far from finished. Several pirate research vessels were orbiting Zebus while Samus fought on the surface below. After the fall of Mother Brain, the ships escaped, with the hopes of finding enough resources to rebuild their forces and take their revenge. After discovering a possible pirate colony on planet Talon IV, Samus has again prepared for war, hoping to end the pirate threat forever. And with how perfectly it's spaced out for this beginning too, it's clear what the intentions may have been, but I theorize that they may have cut this because Nintendo may have wished for her to remain silent. A far cry to what came down the road, of course. Now as mentioned, Metroid Prime's development stemmed in taking a lot of inspiration from Super Metroid, and so one of the things they did was try to recreate a number of enemies from Super Metroid in 3D, according to 3D artist Mike Sneath. In fact, entire animations and AI were made around these old enemies too, but were told to scrap it by Nintendo themselves in favor of making new enemies. So what they did instead was to make a new enemy model that was different in design, but functioned similarly to what they had made. For example, the classic enemy, the Ripper, was replaced by the glider in the final game. Rippers were used in the classic games as a means to platform on. In other words, it would have been used to swing across like gliders in the final game. In fact, we even still got the model for the Ripper in the game. If one model swaps it with the glider, it functions perfectly! While models of other Super Metroid enemies don't exist, some of their names remain in the data that shows what they became. These include the enemy's Fire Flea, which became the Plasma Mite, and Metari, which became the Shriek Bat. Now another cut enemy is the enemy Sovas. A concept part exists for him, and it appears that he was in the pre-release demo disc for the game in a containment tank, but was dead. It was however removed in the final game, but its scan data still is in the data, as well as the sound effects. Have a listen. However, it seems some of the chunks of his model are still accessible via the data of the Chozo Ruins, which shows where he might have appeared actually. Now moving on to Space Pirates, much like the earlier enemies, they were also envisioned to look more like their Super Metroid design, as seen in these concept arts, having a more organic look and lacking armor while still having large claws. As well, another archetype of them was also supposed to exist, that had biomechanical weapons directly attached to their bodies, would have fit well with how they were modifying themselves heavily with Phazon. In fact, speaking of Phazon, remember that research lab in the Fendrana Drifts that had a tube with what looks to be chunks of whatever they were experimenting on? A scan of it in the game says the tank holds the remains of Experiment 7526, conversion of elite pirate unsuccessful. Now what I'd like to present is this concept art, which is what this thing would have looked like that is in the tube if pieced together. Which if one does take these pieces out and snips them together, they make this odd monstrosity. According to a former Retro Studios developer, it was intended as a scrapped enemy of mutated space pirates from that failed experiment with Phazon. It even still has that giant claw from the classic space pirate design, 
Now we know on Talon 4, all the Chozo are dead, thanks to the appearance of Phazon, and all you got are their ruins. But it appears that one might have been intended to survive at least, based on this constant part that we have. But why is this under the enemy category? Well, it's mainly because of this one animation, which shows a rather deranged and on-guard Chozo. Thus, it may have in fact tried to attack Samus if encountered. As well, remember the Chozo ghost that would randomly attack you? Well, apparently a winged variant was also planned too, possibly giving it more versatility. Now, the concept of giant metroids aren't new to the series. A few of them had you do endurance runs in fact in their final area against them. Well, they were also set to appear in Metroid Prime. We have a concept art that showcases them next to the final boss Metroid Prime, and they are absolutely massive. In fact, there were other Metroid designs also considered too in pre-production on the idea of making more mutated Metroids, and some of these designs are truly grotesque. Which in my personal opinion, I think it would have been an absolutely amazing addition if they were added. As well, the Omega Metroid from Metroid 2 and of course at that time Metroid Fusion was also set to appear in the game too. Might have even had something to do with the connectivity feature between both the games. Now while Metroid Prime had a ton of enemies that were cut, a large number of bosses were cut too actually. Both classic and new. Going to the very beginning, in the 2001 Space World trailer that was showcased earlier, we see Samus fighting the Parasite Queen. Except she's not in a chamber like in the final game. Having a very spider-like animation of going along walls and climbing ceilings even. Now a rather fascinating boss fight that was cut is the Shigoth Prime. This was supposed to be the third and final form of the Shigoth species that was found in the Fendrana Drifts. It seems it made it quite late into development too, with its models and animations all built as found on senior animator Derek Bonokowski's website. Based on the concept art, it would have been a massive beast as seen next to Samus. However, because of the enemy looking too much like an RPG villain as opposed to a Metroid one as stated by Nintendo, it was removed. So instead we got the Ice Golem Thardis, as the boss of Fendara Drifts. Which brings us to Thardis himself, which while yes he did appear as the boss of Fendara Drifts, it was actually supposed to be the boss of Magmoor Caverns, an area of the game that actually lacked a boss. According to 3D artist Mike Sneath, the battle would have waged in a large lava pit arena. In fact, we have this animation showcase of Thardis from Bonokowski's website, that depicts it with an orange core as opposed to the final blue core that it had in the final game, indicating how it would have appeared in Magmore Caverns. Alas, the change was likely done as they wanted some form of a boss in Fendara Drifts, even if it meant leaving Magmore Caverns without one. Now moving on to the next element, Forest, we got the boss Flagra, which was quite different than the beta stage. Originally, it was set to appear in a forest, and was supposed to hatch from a seed, as shown by 3D artist Mike Sneath. This all contrasted heavily with the final games, as he instead appears in the Chozo ruins instead of a forest. As well, his vines were part of his body originally too, before being detached and becoming part of the level. Makes sense why this battle stage was cut, as full forest levels aren't very Metroid-like overall. Now another cut boss fight is this flying insect looking boss, looking to resemble a space pirate actually, or even similar to a flying pirate that appears in the final game, but it still has a lot of differences. In fact, while we have the model with its animations here, it in fact even has an earlier form as seen in this concept part that depicts it with a metroid tied to its back. Potentially uses the metroid to fly? But it's still up in the air as to whether he would have actually been a boss or not. It's definitely more advanced than your average flying pirate, but at the same time quite small for a boss considering it's next to a metroid here. It's even possible that it might have been a mini boss. Now let's get to the classic bosses that were to appear in the game. Most popular is Kraid. Yes, this massive beast that took up twice the screen size would have appeared and we got two concept arts of him actually. The first of which is a more normal and familiar one, but adds a lot more than just three projectiles to his belly. Could have been quite a tough battle actually. But then we got the version that they wish to use, and it's this one, where he had a metal shell that replaced part of his head. 
It could have very well been the repaired mecha form, much like the way we have a mecha form for Ridley, considering this game does take place after Metroid 1, where they both were handily defeated. The idea would have been to climb to the top of rickety platforms and drop something on Kraid's metal head to damage him. The projectiles would have been back at 3 here of course, unlike the threatening earlier concert part, and looks to have appeared in the phase on mines based on the background, meaning he would have been the boss instead of Omega Pirate. Gene Kohler went on to mention that they were deep into development of this level, but ultimately due to time constraints, they couldn't polish it enough to make it good. As such, they cut him out altogether and provided Omega Pirate as the boss of the phase on mines instead. Which might mean that Omega Pirate was an easier boss to create in comparison. And now we have the big bad Aurora herself, Mother Brain, planned to make her debut in full 3D. There is one major concept part of her, which has these eyeballs translucent throughout it. It may simply point to how Mother Brain looks over all operations of the Space Pirates, and we also got Samus right next to her here, which shows that Mother Brain might have been at her largest size yet. Of course, it never made it to actual development, as no actual model of her exists, so this was obviously cut early. To round out the bosses, let's talk about Ridley. Ridley had a number of different designs considered originally. Everything from an almost entirely mechanical form, to a more organic one with its ribcage poking out, maybe pointing to him still being injured from Metroid 1, and this insane looking orange and red form that even had a Samus-like cannon equipped it to him. Imagine getting a fireball to the face while dodging laser blasts from his cannon there too. But there is one more curious piece of art for Ridley, and it's this peaceful looking art of him. It looks very Chozo-like in design, with Samus standing right in front of him, but with no provocation. It is theorized that maybe in the big battle with Ridley and near the end, he'd get possessed by the Chozo ghost, which caused him to go into a metamorphosis to reflect his possession even. In fact, the art is literally called Dark Possessed Ridley, which adds a whole credence to this theory in fact. Could have been a very beautiful way to end the battle to be honest. What comes after Ridley is the final area of the game, the Impact Crater. It's a very short section, which has a few platforms with some fission metroids around before facing the big bad Metroid Prime herself. However, the original plans for this were to make it a full scale level, much like every other area in the game as seen in these various concept arts. Showcasing an area that looked very different from anything in the game, with lava shooting out, strange plant or wildlife, and potentially the level itself being alive with the door looking like it opened up in a rather organic manner of approached. The size of this original area would have in fact fit well with the giant metroids I showcased earlier, as it'd be big enough for them to nicely fit there for Samus to combat. Another possibility might have been that time constraints may have led to the level being severely downscaled. Now while we have delved into some audio, there are still some more things to discuss on this matter. Originally, the game's audio was being developed by Tommy Tallarico, who has an impressive list of western games he's worked on. You may also recognize him from doing reviews on Electric Playground with Victor Lucas. Him and his studio were in charge of making all the sound effects for this game. This subsequently was done as the in-house audio team at Retro was quite busy with the other projects including Ravenblade that was not yet cancelled. However, once those projects were dropped, this freed up the in-house team and so Tommy Tallarico's services were not needed anymore. Even so, a large amount of audio was already produced, and used in-game as confirmed by a correspondence between audio producer Scott Peterson and Talarico himself, which states, I am in the process of archiving all of our audio data, and was hoping to get a little help from Talarico Studios. Almost all the sounds your studio provided were utilized in some ways or another, and a few have really become signature elements to the game and to Samus herself. In fact, this very game led to Talarico even being nominated for Outstanding Achievement in Sound Design. But even then, some of the audio still was not used altogether. What may have been cut is still a mystery. However, some audio was still found within the data. Whether they were made by Talarico or the in-house team isn't confirmed, but these include some older versions of songs that have a slight difference and two key pieces of audio that are worth listening to. The first... Intense heat readings detected behind this door. 
which normally in game was shown in text form. I theorized that it was cut alongside Samus' monologue, which may be because they didn't want any voice dialogue in the game in the end. The second... This one clearly sounds like a charge beam, and in fact is labeled as Phazon Gun. Normally, the Phazon Beam which you use in the final battle with Metroid Prime simply fires off without the ability to charge it. However, a sound effect exists here that may indicate that the plan was to let you charge it too like any other beam. Now to bring this home, as many of you know, when you connect Metroid Fusion to Metroid Prime, it unlocks the Fusion Suit and a version of Metroid 1 that you can play. However, according to former Retro Studios developer, Instead of Metroid 1, Super Metroid was planned to be the unlockable game. This was an obvious choice considering how much the development that we have gone over had oozed from the influence of Super Metroid. So it would have been the perfect choice. It was being helmed by programmer David Kirsch. Proof of concept even exists for it as the scrapped UI selector was found on the artist Danny Richardson's website. However, Nintendo soon got a whiff of this and since Kirsch was using a third party emulator to achieve this, Nintendo ordered the removal of Super Metroid. And so we got Metroid 1 instead, using an in-house Nintendo sanctioned emulator. And so in late 2002, Retro Studio completed the game and released Metroid Prime after an impressive two years of development. It became an instant critical hit, game of the year, and considered as one of the best games of all time. While it had a rough history of changes with Nintendo HQ at the hell of much of it, these very changes produced a masterpiece. Some of the ideas couldn't get in due to time constraints, some changes were also made for the better, and some of these ideas also could have made the game even better. Even so, the end product that we got led to a true revival to a dormant IP that translated successfully into 3D and eventually became a market hit to warrant the sequel Metroid Prime 2, a game that I plan to cover eventually, so hit the subscribe button, for I plan to be back with more Metroid and other games cut content too. Hit the like button and comment below on what was your favorite part of development here. So everyone, thank you for watching!